across and introduce ourselves so our public will know who's working very hard for them. We'll start on this end. Thank you, Commissioner. Bridget Dory running the public Zoom. Leslie Hervey, assistant to the clerk. Jacqueline Canietto, clerk of the board. County Commissioner Denise Driehaus. Jeff Aluto, County Administrator. Thank you so much. And I am Stephanie Summerall Dumas, President of the Hamilton County Board of Commissioners. We'll move forward with our first order of business, which is COVID-19 comprehensive update. Commissioner Greg Kesterman, welcome. Well, good morning, Commissioners. I appreciate the opportunity to provide a briefing on the status of COVID within Hamilton County. Today, Hamilton County continues to see a lot of activity with COVID-19. We are up to 9,000 active cases of COVID. And as you recall, week after week, when I provide this briefing, that number continues to increase. We um, are currently at 358 cases countywide per day. Uh, does not hit as high as we were back in December when we were at 716. But clearly the trend that you can see is upward. Um, the last few days have been, once again, you heard me talk a couple weeks ago about a little bit stable, um, but generally speaking, we continue to see an upward climb in COVID-19 cases. Percent positivity for the region is at 11.3%. Hamilton County is slightly below that at 10%. Um, we are seeing about 4,000 tests per day in Hamilton County, which is, once again, good news. If you feel sick, if you're concerned about COVID, we want you to go out, we want you to get tested. The reproductive value for today in Hamilton County is 0.97. For the region, we are at 0.98. In talking with folks in the hospital systems, they are continuing to feel a lot of strain from COVID-19. Right now within our hospitals, we have 566 people within the hospital systems, 164 in the ICU, of which 107 are on ventilators. Mm -hmm. This is putting a lot of burden on our system and uh, it's definitely causing stress for those hospital systems. We continue to see the predominant age group within the hospital system between 60 and 69. Although you can clearly see the 50 to 59 age group is not too, too far behind. The entire bar here represents the state of Ohio and the darker shade at the bottom represents Southwest Ohio. Turning to the Centers for Disease Control map, uh, here in Hamilton County, we are at 336 cases per 100,000. And as mentioned, our percent positivity is 10. We are in an area of high spread of COVID-19. So we continue to message that folks need to be cautious. Even if you're vaccinated, we're asking folks to wear those masks and be careful in what they're out and about doing. So the number one thing we can do to protect ourselves and to slow the spread of COVID is get vaccinated. And we continue to see progress week after week, albeit it's much slower than I prefer. For those over the age of 12, we are at 68% vaccinated. And for those over the age, or for the entire population, we're at 56% vaccinated. Our region set a goal of 80%. Um, we are at 65 and older. We have hit the 80% threshold. When you look at the national goal, we have hit the, uh, that, the national goal for those over the age of 50. We still have a lot of work though, and we're continuing to make sure that we provide access around the county so folks can get vaccinated. The last slide I have talks a little bit about boosters and the process for, um, for the different approvals. You know, it's a complicated process and we want in our country to have the best and safest vaccines available. And to that end, there's a lot of data and studying that has to happen. This week in the news, we heard a lot about booster shots. Tomorrow, we know the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices will be meeting. They'll be meeting Wednesday and Thursday this week. It's anticipated that they will approve booster shots for those over the age of 65, as well as for those at severe risk for significant COVID-19. Once that gets approved by them, we look to ODH to kind of tell local health departments and providers throughout Ohio how to roll out that program we do stand ready to do so here in Hamilton County. The other group that we've heard a lot about were the five to 11 year olds. We anticipate the FDA to approve that here shortly. So we're excited for that. And once again, many providers here in Hamilton County stand ready to begin um, that vaccination process. That is all I have prepared. Happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Um, as it relates to the booster shot, that's one question I was gonna ask you. It's a Pfizer booster shot. So 
I, I don't want to explain it and answer the question, but the booster is just an additional Pfizer shot. Is there anything else in that booster? No, it's identical to the medicine you received your first dose. Mm -hmm. And the slide that I had up, it did show um, kind of the progression. We know that Moderna is seeking uh, the same types of appro approval that Pfizer has. Mm -hmm. But if you originally received Moderna, it is not yet time for a booster shot, just for Pfizer folks. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, in addition, um, as we read off those numbers, sometimes we get accustomed to hearing the numbers. But And I know we're not at that place. but everyone is a person, everyone is a family, everyone is part of a community. And so that if we just remember that, I know when you were saying ICU, and I'm saying how many are in ICU, so um, just to remember, even though the numbers were get, getting a little better, but we don't see that now, but uh, those are families that we're talking about. And I appreciate you coming uh, every week now to explain that and keep us updated. So I will open it up to my colleagues, and I think there may be um, some media here that may have a few questions. Uh, Vice President Reese. First of all, I just want to thank uh, Commissioner Kesterman for all of your work. And uh, for some reason, my mic does not work with my mask. We, one, we get some technology. We done turned it up and everything. Sure. But I want to be clear when I'm talking to uh, people listening. I want to just thank you. Um, we are trying to hit this, uh, fight this COVID at every different creative way possible. Um, this past Friday, uh, we teamed up with Public Health and a 513 Relief Bus. Last week, you told us that we should get a test kit to hold at our house if we can, and we're giving those out uh, as well. There were questions. We had hundreds that showed up. Uh, and was one of our biggest days of giving the shot from a mobile um, unit perspective. But there were some questions about the Johnson, people who are over 60 that took the Johnson. Can you explain that? They will, that is that looking into a booster or they are okay just what they got the one shot? So um, you may recall back in December when the vaccine started rolling out, the first vaccine publicly available was the Pfizer vaccine, followed by Moderna and then ultimately followed by the Janssen or the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. The approval process through the FDA requires a significant amount of data before they are able to authorize that or even author, uh, give an emergency use authorization. And so we anticipate at some point boosters for, for the Janssen vaccine, but not yet because there's not enough data. Thank you. You're welcome. Do you have anything else? No, not right now. Commissioner Driehaus. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Commissioner, for being here. Um, I, we have been hearing a lot about breakthrough cases, about people that are vaccinated. They are, though, getting um, COVID. Are, are numbers of those hospitalized the same or similar to what we've been seeing, or are they deviating at all? meaning that I think it was 98% of the folks in the hospital were not vaccinated. Are we seeing any deviation from that percentage? So when you look at the state of Ohio data, which covers from January 1st of this year through the present, the percent uh, of breakthrough cases is increasing slightly, but it's anywhere from two to 3%. When you take a snapshot of who is in the hospital today at any one of our systems, it's much closer to 20%. And that's because we're looking at just a smaller piece of time and the denominator, the, the number of folks that have been in the hospital and vaccinated is much less. So probably it's closer to 20%. I, maybe it's those that are, what was the 98% or the ones that are passing away? Is that what that number is? Um, so the state of Ohio data says about 1% of yeah. deaths are breakthrough. Yeah, okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, do we have anyone in the audience that may have a question for our commissioner as it relates to the COVID? Okay. Thank you so much. Absolutely. You're welcome. Thank mm -hmm. you. We'll move forward. Um, we're going to, if it's okay, if Anderson is ready, Anderson Township, we're going to move you up on the agenda. Um, we're waiting for someone else for the We Must Save Us campaign. Hi, Harry. Uh, good afternoon, mm -hmm. uh, commissioners, and, and good afternoon, Madam President. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for this time today. Uh, I'm Harry Blant with HCDC. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. I can hear you. And mm -hmm. um, we're here today to discuss a community reinvestment area program for your consideration. 
Uh, we have Anderson Township officials, Vicki Earhart and Steve Sievers here, who will present the details of the project. We also have the developers, Metropolitan Holdings here as well. If you remember back in February of 2021, we brought before you uh, the establishment of the CRA in Anderson Township for this project. It was then certified by the state of Ohio in April 2021. So it is allowed to entertain incentives that uh, you can consider. Um, the current proposal is, is, is on the former Skytop retail facility. Uh, it's a residential project with 361 units and uh, they're requesting 49.95% for 15 years. Uh, I'm going to introduce Vicki Herhart unless there are any questions and she can give you many more details. No questions. Right. You can, Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. I just wanted to express our appreciation on behalf of our Board of Township Trustees for the Commissioner's prior action and for hearing our case today. This is an important project. It is not in the heart of Anderson Township. It is on the edge of Anderson Township, so it brings benefits to surrounding communities such as Mount Washington and Linwood and some of the others that we'll show you on a map here today. But I just wanted to again express our appreciation for your consideration of this project. It is important to our community and others. Thank you. Right now, you. Steve Sievers, who is our assistant administrator and our economic development expert is gonna make the presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. Thanks afternoon. again, and thank you, Ms. Earhart, for your introduction, and Mr. Blanton for your help establishing the CRA back in February. As you may recall, the CRA area actually in involved a number of properties in the uh, sky top areas where we refer, we refer to it. Ms. Earhart commented about the relationship of this site to Anderson Township and the rest of the community. As you can say, this is our far northwestern border. Uh, most folks think they're in Mount Washington. Uh, you actually enter Anderson and go back into Mount Washington in this area. This is a site that, uh, as you zoom in here, right across the Beachmont Levee, across from Lunkin Airport, and the site of what is becoming kind of a, a hub here in Anderson. We're very excited. Our comprehensive plan that was approved back in 2017 called for this as a, one of our three key sites. And the project that you have before you for this uh, in the CRA area really fits that bill. A little bit of history that we were discussing this beforehand with a few folks. This is the site of the former El Rancho Rankin. So for those longtime Cincinnatians, uh, that brings a whole uh, set of other issues and background and history to the site. But it, it goes without saying we had to at least uh, provide a little bit of context for those that might be familiar with what was there before and what we're proposing here today. Uh, this is the site history of Beachmont Avenue. Um, the Skytop Shopping Center was constructed in 1999 uh, by Jeffrey R. Anderson Real Estate. It never quite materialized into the site that we had hoped it would be. Uh, the site actually had a value in about 15 years ago of nearly $22 million. Uh, today that value is less than $5 million. So we're, we're sitting at about 20% of the value. Much of the center is, has, was vacant then. Actually driving through today, all of it is vacant. The Remke left the site in 2019, which occupied the portion on the far right there in the site. But portions of the center were actually never developed. So there are unfinished spaces that have sat vacant for nearly 25 years. It clearly has not performed as a retail site. Um, when we came to the commissioners back uh, earlier this, late in 2020 and earlier this year, the effort was to establish a community reinvestment area that would not only uh, affect this site, but also the, the area around it known as Elston Road. There are uh, seven, there were done seven homes that were on that, on that property um, owned by various owners. Several of those are vacant as well. So our hope is that this kind of is a kickstart for that whole area and really expands beyond Anderson Township, but provides a, a benefit for the surrounding region. The project description, again, the purpose is to, to raise the center. Uh, they'll leave the retail site out front, the Big Ash Brewery site. They'll also leave the former Starbucks and uh, a separate developer is seeking to construct a retail building out front in that area. Um, we're very excited because in our comprehensive plan that I referenced earlier, I uh, talked about diversifying the, the nature of our housing stock. We are 87% owner occupied, uh, mm -hmm. traditionally three, four, five bedroom houses. This proposal is to bring a, a development that entails a lot of one bedroom units, much more affordable units, but also those that would attract uh, both for uh, folks that are empty nesters, keeping them in the community, as well as a younger population as well. It also sits at the nexus of the Little Miami Scenic Trail Extension. If you've been by that area lately and seen the work that's gone on, we're thrilled at what this could be. Really, as we've described it, this is what you've seen in Loveland. This is what you've seen in Milford, but this is in Hamilton County. So direct access to the bike trail with the number of grants that we've secured uh, and by 2023, that'll all be complete. And our goal really is to provide a mixed-use de development on this site with retail, 
uh, with the residential that has not been in this property to date. This is the, the site as you see the entrance, and I'm afraid to try to find the, the, the laser on here, but you see the entrance off Beach One Avenue, which is where it currently exists today. Uh, you see the two retail buildings on the front that will remain as well as the one that is proposed. And the development is a four to five story, 361 unit uh, residential community. It will be one of the largest buildings in Anderson Township, if not probably the largest square footage wise. Um, but it will really provide a destination in a node in an area that has long since looked for that. Uh, again, the site and the amenity package is consistent with the types of units that we've seen popping up in the, uh, in the Cincinnati neighborhoods, but also in some of the suburban communities here in Hamilton County. And, and again, we're thrilled to have that opportunity. I should note that the Metropolitan Holdings representatives, Matt Valesky uh, and Andrew Lemon are with us today. So if there's any questions, and they may want to make a few comments uh, at the end of my presentation here as well. This is the site. So I mentioned the comprehensive plan, the work that we went through. This site actually went through two zone changes. Um, the nearest single family residences sit actually above the site. So you can get a sense there. Those are, uh, that's the Signal Hill community. Uh, those are homes valued at the 600,000 to over $1 million price range uh, that have long since looked over the back of a vacant retail center. Uh, up on the hillside going up towards Mount Washington, you have the CRA area, which is another six or seven homes that are in that vicinity. Uh, and again, that's some of the comments and concerns that were raised dealt with how that would be treated. And I think the, the developer did a wonderful job through that process in identifying those. It's character sketch and image of what's there. Again, blending the, the environment, blending the architecture materials that you see at Lunkin Airport, the Art Deco that we see over even Union Terminal and blending that into the development. Primarily four stories. There are some five story uh, elements on the corners that would basically be the two bedroom plus den opportunities or three bedrooms that are there that are signature kind of uh, hallmark pieces of this proposal. Uh, and again, we're thrilled at what this could bring for that surrounding area. The final use for the property, again, is to demolish the retail structure in the back. Uh, this is the tenant mix that the developer has outlined at this point in time for those 361 units. Again, the majority of which, more than two thirds, would be studio or one bedroom. So really attracting a different uh, clientele to Anderson than what we typically have in our other areas. And I should note, this is now going to be the second multifamily community in our multifamily development in our community in the last four decades. Sing, uh, Skytop uh, will, will be built um, in the next two to three years. The Stonegate development on Nagel Road expanded, and that was actually the last project we had back in the early 90s, late 80s. So we, are, we need this product. We need housing opportunities and options in our community. And this is the project that we think that will help to make that happen. You see the projected rent ranges between 985 and 2500 a month. Again, those 2500 would be those nine units, the three bedroom uh, penthouse type of things on the corners. Um, and again, maintaining the development out front. Our request is to proceed with the 49.95% CRA abatement, which was outlined in the CRA area that was established six months ago. Again, this is a project that that was established on the front end of this project. So nothing has changed. Uh, there have been a few minor deviations, minor changes in the, in the site plan and the unit mix, but what you see before you is what you saw in February, and we very much appreciate your support for that area to take that first step. This is the second step in that process. Uh, you see the estimated uh, investment by Metropolitan Holdings, approximately $33 million. and uh, again, we foresee that even with the CRA, uh, that value of that property, the, the unabated portion will be significantly more than the $4 million or $5 million that we have today. Uh, it would also, we hope that we'll spread out onto Elson Road and some of the blight that we have in that area and really provide that critical mass. Uh, this is, again, a little bit of the recap, the value history in the site, um, the benefits to the community as far as um, for moderate low income persons and providing a different housing opportunity in our area, and then central to alternate transportation. Uh, Metro provides daily service uh, 18 hours a day in this area, so it's very accessible from a transit perspective. It's also very accessible to the trail network that I mentioned earlier uh, to appeal to a much different uh, population than, than what most folks might commonly associate with Anderson. And then also the, the, the top bullet there, number five there, which is the opportunity for economic growth. Uh, Metropolitan is projecting over two and a half million dollars of disposable income from this development. That will primarily be spent outside of Anderson Township. I mean, there's really, other than the retail out front and the convenience stores that are there, you have to go three miles before you get back into Anderson Township. So this spinoff benefit will be in Mount Washington, it'll be in Linwood, in the East End, in other neighborhoods that are far closer to the site than we are in, in Anderson. With that, uh, again, I don't have any other slides necessarily. I don't know if uh, Matt or Andrew would like to make any comments from the development perspective or if there's questions 
any of our team would be more than happy to answer those and we really appreciate your consideration. Thank you so much. If there are, if there are additional comments, you're certainly welcome to come up from the developers. Uh, my name is Matt Vacasey. I'm the founder and CEO of Metropolitan Holdings. It's great to be with you today. Mm -hmm. uh, just would like to reiterate what Steve and Vicki have shared. <clears throat> this is a tremendous opportunity for our, not only our company, but uh, to work with Anderson Township to deliver, to deliver a best-in-class multifamily community to this location. Um, when I first found the site and learned about it and really studied the area and the opportunity to serve the, the, the market that really is underserved, through working with a gentleman named Michael Din, uh, who's helped us with our market study, he identified a need of almost 8,800 units on the east side of this, of, of Cincinnati. So, <clears throat> very excited about that. Uh, to piggyback on what Steve was saying about the bike path, tying in with the Little Miami bike path, our residents will be basically have the opportunity to get on a bike system and drive, ride all the way to Yellow Springs uh, and ride. Um, west into downtown Cincinnati and then south uh, as, the, as that connector uh, comes together. So um, we're excited to join Big Ash Brewery on this site, which is a local brewery, local business that's open. They've been here about 14 or 16 months they've been open. They've been doing very well. And our hope is that we'll see Starbucks return to this site. They left pre-COVID, didn't come back uh, because of the uncertainty of what was, what was going on with this parcel. So. With that said, I'm um, happy to answer any questions that you, that you folks have. And, um, you know, and appreciate the opportunity to be here to talk about the project. Thank you so much. Um, okay, um, we're gonna open it up for my colleagues to see if there are any questions or comments. Thank you so much. Uh, Vice President Reese. Uh, thank you. I, I did have one question about the rent mix. Um, I don't know if we go back to that slide, is 900. $85, I know one of the things we wanted to make sure that uh, different diverse incomes can participate here. Uh, now we starting out at 985, is there any commitment on the, the duration of the CRA that we keep a mix so there's some affordability? We, we believe, and Andrew Lemon is our CFO, he's here as well that are at 985 i think we're almost at the 80 percent ami level right now in hamilton county um so i think with the range of rents we have we will be able to serve uh, you know a, a diversity in, in terms of income population for tenants at the site yeah no i'm just saying this is the entry and the cra is not just today it'll be you get you know it goes all the way through and even though it may not be 985, that might not be the number, but I just want to make sure we keep that mix. A lot of times we start off with the rental, it's 985, and then as soon as they get the, the credits or CRA, uh, not you, but others, next thing you know, they've, you know, they've jumped up and you know, we got what we needed from the, from the government entity and we're gonna do what we wanna do. So I just wanna make sure are we gonna keep a mix over the duration of the, the yeah, property I mean, these, is that your intention i guess is my yeah, thought that's correct i mean the the, uh, the rents on these uh, specific units are for the smaller units so you know they're kind of really driven by the market demand which touches based on uh, reflects back to the market study that we had prepared from michael Den. so as the units get bigger you know the, the rental rates do go up if that if that makes sense yeah no i understand they go up i'm just saying a lot of times we do these type of credits or cra's and we start off, so today, if you move in today, we've got a mix and it looks great. And then five years from now or two years from now, you then trickle, 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 and now we don't have a mix. So I just wanna make sure we're gonna to continue to have a mix. It might not be that price, but whatever that price is. I'm sure the 2000 will be more every year or whatever, but I wanna keep a mix because that's the reason we would be supporting well, yeah, this. The, the mix would be there. So the, the rents proportionally yes. for the entire community could move up and down depending on where the market is. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Commissioner Driehaus. Thank you, Madam President. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being here this afternoon. Um, I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on the community engagement portion of the process. If, uh, or I don't know if you're the appropriate person to answer the question, but we generally wanna know um, not only Anderson Township, but Mount Washington, some of the surrounding areas that you identified as um, 
communities that will likely benefit from the project, um, wondering what kind of community engagement either uh, from this particular project or prior to it has taken place. Um, thank you for that, that question and touching on that. It's probably something I, I passed through pretty quickly on the presentation. The property itself was rezoned um, back in 2018. It was zoned retail when it was developed. It's been retail for a couple decades. Uh, it was actually down, down to a retail to, or a residential development. It went through a series of public hearings and ultimately rezoning by the township trustees as we have local township zoning. It started with the county uh, regional planning commission. In 2020, Metropolitan brought a, a request back to modify that to basically add, add units in our mind to help make that economics of this project work because the 2018 development never went anywhere. And so um, that went through another zone change process as well, several hearings, a number of hearings at the township level. Uh, so there's probably been at least six to seven public hearings specifically for this site. Um, and of course, notification to neighbors and all that. The plan, the township's comprehensive plan, which was adopted in 2017, identified three key properties in the township. One was the Beach Acres property on Beachmont, one was this site, and another down on Kellogg near uh, Valterra Park. That had a significant amount of public input for almost a year to hone in on those three sites, and so that is what really became a focus and why we kind of actually were out there marketing this. Specifically, the comments that were raised, I mentioned some with the nearby neighbors that, that were addressed, I think, very well by the owners. What we actually saw was our neighbors in Mount Washington coming out in support of this. They saw the benefit for their neighborhood, for the community. Um, and again, you have a five lane roadway that serves the site. It sits at the bottom of the hill. So uh, there were some site planning issues and concerns that they had, but those were addressed fairly quickly. And it, 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 like I said, we had, ironically, you don't usually have that. You have neighboring concerns from, of neighbors that don't want the development next door and the impacts. We did not see that in this situation. So we're, we're thrilled to have that partnership with Mount Washington. It's a great relationship that we have uh, with our neighbors to the west. So. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I've driven by, I used to drive by this all the time, as I shared earlier, when it was the El Rancho Rankin. So I know the site well because it was such a landmark um, and such an unusual um, building at that time. So, I, you know, we have been promoting housing and increased um, opportunity for housing throughout the county. So I think this is in line with what we as a commission have been talking about. Uh, so I think this is a great use. It, clearly the retail was not the best use because it's been vacant for so long. And if there was a need, I feel like um, the market would have driven folks to go into that site. And so the fact that you've converted it now to residential, I think is probably the right move. And so I just wanna say thank you for bringing it in front of us. I think um, we are always interested, especially at the volume you've got, uh, and having these larger projects come into our community to offer options, as you say, for folks of all differing income levels, not just a certain segment of the population. So thank you for the presentation. Thank you. I'd just like to make a comment. Um, the CRA, you wanna, you wanna come back up? Or? <laughs> Um, I just wanted to comment that the CRA legislation provides a maximum of 15 years, 49.95% abatement, and I think this is a very reasonable uh, ask for um, our board, and so we will be bringing it forth, I'm sure, for some uh, legislation to happen. So thank, thank you. you for bringing it. I think it's nice when you see reasonable <laughs> you know, uh, legislation come forward to us as it relates to uh, development. So thank you so much on your work on this project. We appreciate it. Again, mm -hmm. this, is, this is only our second CRA, mm -hmm. the earlier one you saw just a few months back for another key site. But it's important to stress, again, if we'd left that site as it was um, with the images that you saw there at $4 million valuation a year, mm -hmm. even with the abatement, this will be much more, many more times $4 million valuation unabated. Mm -hmm. So it will be a value added in addition to all the spinoff benefits. So mm -hmm. you know, we appreciate your time and consideration. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If there's any questions between now and uh, the next meeting, please let us know. Thank you so much for coming. Madam um, President? Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Just briefly, uh, presuming board concurrence on the project this, uh, to the question about process and next steps, mm -hmm. uh, this would come forward as legislation to the board next Thursday on your agenda. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Madam President. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, can I also say I, I do appreciate the um, presentations um, that we've had. These are, I think, the second one for Anderson Township. But it has been um, helpful for me as a, a new, from my first year, to be able to ask questions, be pull, uh, brought up to date, make sure that there were questions we asked, make sure the community, Anderson Township community, their concerns could also be addressed. So I just want to say that that process has been uh, very helpful. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we have the item on our agenda, item two, we must save us campaign update. Um, I don't believe the presenters are here. I'm not going to uh, delay. She's, She's on, on Zoom? Zoom? Oh, I thought she was coming here, okay. All right, so let's move forward with uh, we must save us campaign update. Renee Mahaffey Harris. Um, I hope in the future I can come in person. So, first of all, um, I, I just want to thank the people who took you to the President's Commission to us and Vice President Reese and Commissioner Greenhouse uh, for your ongoing um, efforts um, to make sure that our community um, has access to the vaccine, understands um, what is happening uh, locally throughout the state relative to COVID 19. The We Must Save Us campaign launched because of your initial support um, in November December, then it led us to launch the campaign, um, informed by research. And um, because of additional funding that has occurred for us through the Health Collaborative, um, we have been able to continue to work on understanding where people lie in their opinions and feelings and concerns and um, some reluctancy. Um, relative to the vaccine, but a, a huge uptick and a large percentage, as Commissioner Heshman shared. We've seen great increases, but there's still work to do. Um, so this first slide is, uh, again, the awards that occurred as a result of the initial work um, that began earlier this year. Next slide, please. We have been able to launch through digital approaches, working in collaboration with um, uh, about 13 weapon led organizations, and of those 13, um, six of them created videos that urged the community to get the vaccine. And those videos were launched virtually, but also through Rover 12. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the slide that I just moved past just really spoke to the online presence. And so sometimes, you know, we, we know there are many barriers relative to access to um, web based applications, but the COVID 19 community resources back on site continues to have um, very, very strong interest across the county um, with close to 5,000 um, visitors um, over a three month period, and that number has pretty much stayed very constant. And these are unique, different visitors, um, as well as um, linking to this information, and that's information about where they COVID testing, linking to the testing for test site. Um, as well as information on the changing dynamics from the Delta variant um, to the status of the booster, as well as the status of the third shot for new compromised people. Um, uh, next slide, please. The, um, you know, the in-person um, opportunities have fully multiplied. Um, so over a three-month period, we have been able to work in collaboration with many organizations um, including the 503 Relief Bus, um, which we were you know, able to join um, uh, the members of the 503 Relief Bus and, and Commissioner Reese just this past Friday and um, at the Pridestone, um, and, and really just seeing that the community having access and really going to remove people where they are from Forest Park to Lincoln Heights uh, to Mount Healthy, um, people may not potentially all the numbers of vaccines um, but you can see in the 18 events, we've had over 3,000 people participate in those in-person events and over 128 vaccinations conducted on the site, as well as the distribution of test events. The events have ranged from barbershop-focused events, uh, new partners, including uh, the students of the National Medical Association, the Cincinnati Medical Association doctor came on site to answer questions, um, as well as our health department's and involving local businesses and really, you know, you're in a barbershop and you're able to walk in and you're able to get the vaccine on the Saturday. And you're able to ask questions to doctors that we um, as well as drive up locations, as well as many of the other events that happen across our community and being able to tie the vaccine to them. Just um, the past two days or since last Friday, I have had an uptick of a request that we had come to us from four districts throughout the county 
um, in addition to our CPS school district, um, who want to now um, elevate and make it more easily accessible for athletes, parents, and families of four district schools um, to be able to get the vaccine. So we're working really hard with, with the really um, dedicated staff members from all of the health departments to see if we can make that um, but I guess what's encouraging is that our young people are speaking out and saying they're, you know, they want to be a part of voicing encouraging all the democracy. Um, we will be reporting about 12 students from suburban school districts as well as the Cincinnati Public School District and private schools. Um, they're going to be sharing their own testimony as to why they decided to go to that soon and hope that we can elevate the conversation to the families to the peers. And so that's work that's underway now, um, and we look forward to sharing those, those new commercials and new digital strategies um, in the platforms that young people are on um, over the next four weeks. Next slide, please. In addition to digital, television, radio, um, we have been distributing notepads, and we also continue to have involved. And so again, all those things are made possible by the new partners. So um, we're happy to be able to be doing those work, that work, but um, the ability to distribute over 1,600 flyers in can, not leaving them somewhere, but actually handing them to people who are talking with them about COVID-19 and the vaccine, as well as our town halls. And this Thursday, we have a town hall that will feature Woodwood Superintendent, Cincinnati Public School Superintendent, the principal of Lincoln Heights Elementary, as well as Dr. Blue Edgy, and two students, one from the CPS School District and one from the School District. So we'll be talking about how COVID-19 has impacted their lives, what their feelings are about the vaccine, and we're really encouraging a really strong dialogue across our community on Thursday, on the 23rd and 7th of Next slide, please. So media. Um, you know, television, spectrum, um, cable are great ways to get messages out. So I must um, really talk about our collaboration with Local 12 in particular um, through Ms. Bonus um, and the team have been able to continue to deliver the We Must Save Us message on a consistent basis um, in addition to the other, the other media networks and, and people networks. But um, Local 12 has taken a specific interest in, under, in making sure the messages specific to black and brown communities are elevated. Um, so again, um, these these are just kind of reinforcing commercials. Um, COVID-19 community resources.com continues to be an avenue that we link together with uh, the test for the text site as well as other partners who are sharing information who are providing access to some of the barriers that, that go beyond the vaccine testing, but many of the things that I would do with us to be very easily accessible to folks throughout our community. Next slide, please. We also decided to go a little further. We worked with 55 black physicians to draft a letter from the Cincinnati Medical Association and sign it. And that letter has been mailed to over 15,000 households, and those households were targeted based upon the zip codes with lower utilization. Um, and what we, you know, beyond tracking individuals individually, we, which we can't do completely, but what we've been able to see are the zip code, some improvements in the zip codes that we did target um, in vaccine utilization. Um, the ongoing collaboration with Radio One in reaching over 377,000 people across this region um, goes without saying is, is their commitment to making sure people have information we have doctors coming on bi-weekly um, to answer questions for listeners. And um, again, we're continuing to work every avenue possible to make sure that people have information to make important decisions. Um, next slide, please. Um, I don't want to take your time up because, you know, I already had a little delay in getting on here today with you, um, but I would encourage you to uh, click on the link so that you can see the most recent commercials and testimonials that have been that have been recorded with residents across the community. And my last slide, next slide. 
um, is again, we're working together to break the cycle of health disparities. But I think what I really want to also end on here is what, what our increased calls to this organization um, have been about is the trust they feel with the center for closing the health gap. And sometimes if they hear someone else's name, they'll, they'll call and say, well, who was that? Because um, we want to know what you have to say. And, and schools and resource coordinators are calling us and asking if we could come into high schools and provide education. So we are very fortunate to have the Student Net National Medical Association, as well as the Cincinnati Medical Association, who we're going to be partnering with to respond to those requests and to come into schools um, because what, um, and of course this is not significant, you know, I can't give you the data that supports this, but when we get calls from at least 10 different schools and different districts, and the question is, can you come and educate our students so that they can educate their families? So because of the black physicians who are committed to making sure that we get information and have the conversation, um, we are going to be activating um, those efforts in October and continuing to work together with our partners and with the community residents and the individuals whose lives have been impacted to do all that we can to stop the spread of COVID and to make sure people get vaccinated. That's it. Okay. Thank you for this opportunity to give you a quick update. And um, I would love to hear any questions. Thank you, Renee, so much. Thank you for your work, your direct access to the community, providing information and also resources to our community. Um, Bridget, on those links that were just brought up, are those on our website? Or can we put those on our website? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I will open it up to Vice President Reese. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Yes, I wanted to um, also um, thank you, Renee, for your work and uh, partnership. And I'm glad that we're able to use some of the health collaborative money now with the health gap to keep the uh, We Must Save Us campaign uh, continuously going and, um, and even be able to be stronger in some regards to because we need it out there. So I just want to thank you for that. Um, the only thing that I would say, and it's not uh, for Renee, but in terms of this is my marketing hat, the logo, I got to figure out which logo are we. We need to have a consistent logo, so I'll make sure that um, Bridget gives that one to him. And then the other thing I want to address is that uh, a lot of times people ask, well, what is the, you know, what is the commission doing? And a lot of times when we just I always say that when we just slap on um, it at the end, or if we just say, brought to you by the Health Collaborative, people don't know that we've given millions to the Health Collaborative to initiate these type of campaigns. And so, Madam President, one of the things I am pushing for, and I've talked to Jeff about this and Bridget, and I think they're working on it, is to make sure that, one, there should be, a, uh, and I've looked at other counties, and it seems that it, the commission is, um, when they do something, people know it's the commission. Uh, someone was telling me this uh, weekend they were in Montgomery County uh, for a, um, a concert, if you will, it was free. And the parking was free because, and the person there said, this is free parking, compliments of your Hamilton County Commission. And people said, oh man, the commissioners are really doing it. So I'd like to see us, um, and we're working on that, adding with our logo, because everybody is Hamilton County. I mean, you don't need to check in with us. Everyone is Hamilton County whether they're under us or not under us. Um, and we know that Hamilton County Library, it's you know Hamilton County, everything. So one of the things I want to do is want to make sure that our branding is there because we're gonna be putting a lot of dollars out there through the health gap that we're partnering with, um, through other partners that we have, that we got the right logo, and that there's something that says, you know, brought to you by the Hamilton County Commission because we are the ones that are uh, also partnering on this so that we don't get those questions. What are, what are you all doing with this? Because we are working in partnerships with uh, some really good partners like the Health Gap, really good partners, the Health Collaborative, uh, and others, uh, and we're putting a lot of money toward this. So I want to thank Renee because we're able to continue with the We Must Save Us, and she has a grassroots also with a virtual marketing, also with traditional marketing. 
and we're hitting people at a lot of different areas. So um, I do just wanted to uh, thank her for that. And I think that's a great idea you had, Madam President, to put the videos mm -hmm. on our website and we're able to share those uh, as well. So that's great. And I saw a lot of them. I've seen them on cable TV and I've also seen uh, the billboard. So great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Commissioner Reese. Commissioner Driehaus. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Renee, for being with us this afternoon. Always good to see you. Um, I have a question related to the targeting that you referred to uh, when you said the print mailer is targeting 15,000 or so households. Are those zip codes that you're targeting the same zip codes that are identified through the Health Collaborative as the most challenged folks? Um, pretty low vaccination rates, like at 30 and 40 percent. Are those the same thing? They are. They're, they're, it's data that we all receive from the state um, that helps us understand where utilization is still low um, and where it's lowest. So um, those are those are consistent. Um, we we are targeting the low utilization sites that are primarily black and brown. So I, I missed that. Say that again. I said, so we're, we're specifically targeting those low, low utilization sites that are, that are prim primarily diverse communities of black and brown people. Okay. But yeah, it's, I was just wondering if they're syncing up, and it sounds like they are, with where we know we've got these really low rates. Um, and I think the idea of the doctors being the validators is a really good idea, because generally people do rely on doctors to give them safe and consistent health advice on a vaccine. Um, the other thing, Madam President, I, I, so we, uh, this is our last item today. I'm wondering if we can see the videos. Can, mm -hmm. can we, because the links were provided, do you mind, can we see them? Uh, do we have the capacity to do that? Well, we've, oh, we, we don't, we, I'm yeah, sorry. We probably could do All that. All right, I'll do it on day. my own. Because <laughs> okay. I have not seen them, so I was just curious to see them. I, I can give yeah. it a shot. Uh, show off a little bit. Well, let's wait, okay. and we can do it at another time, and we can all uh, take a moment and look at the links ourselves. Um, so, um, uh -huh. Madam President, can I, can I add something? Sure. Uh -huh. um, and I, I just want to say, this past Friday, I forgot to say, uh, I want to thank uh, Health Gap for the partnership. And when we look at those zip codes, uh, the place was packed. I mean, people, we didn't even know this many people would show up. And uh, we partnered with the Health Gap and others and the health uh, commissioner. And we had, I think, the highest number for our mobile operation, uh, almost 80 people. And some of those people we did have to talk to. Uh, but because of, you know, we understand that some people were coming and they got questions. And they were to sit down with the folks from the, both the Health Gap and our, our health uh, department under uh, Commissioner Kesterin and people got the shot. I mean, we had lines of people to line up to get the shot, as well as lines of people that we couldn't even get through, lines of people to get the rental assistance and those kind of things. So I just wanted to uh, highlight that partnership because hundreds showed up on Friday to get this type of help. And uh, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, Renee for that and also acknowledge when we talk about those zip codes, I think that was one of the zip codes where we're getting some of the harder, harder folks uh, that were coming in. And then they were telling folks, uh, we even had another situation at Forest Park uh, where the health gap was there. They do a survey afterwards and ask you, you know, why didn't you or why were you hesitant? Um, what made you change your mind? So, um, and they have the iPads for that. And we were able to get all of Popeye's chicken on that shift at Forest Park to get vaccinated. We got one over there and then they went back and told others. The next thing I know, uh, there was a long line of people trying to get their food, but at least they were vaccinated when they went back. So I do want to thank uh, Renee and her team uh, for that. And I look forward to getting that data that you've been collecting uh, at these sites. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're, you're welcome. I, I just want to, if I could just add one more thing that I think what's important is that at this point, the folks who we are all reaching are the heart, are people who, you know, have many different reasons as to why maybe they haven't made the decision. And um, what we hear as people turn and change their mind 
is that consistency from trusted individuals, organizations, physicians that look like them. And um, so, you know, the collaboration between so many organizations are making that possible. And it's one person at a time at this point, I think across all of our region. So I think each of you for your continued commitment to addressing this time that we're in and thank you for your leadership. And I'm very grateful to be able to collaborate with you. Thank you. And Bridget, are we, is it fair to say that the links will be on our website today? Yes. Okay, that so whoever's what, yes. I, I just have one more question. Um, so Renee, when you have done the um, outreach related to the radio, the billboards, the um, TV spots, can you provide us when kind of this phase has passed, the information that I know you will be collecting related to how that had an impact on the numbers of people perhaps being driven to think about going to get a vaccine um, in the community because I think we as a county are thinking through ways to, for lack of a better word, uh, promote or advertise our small business program, our rent assistance program, our nonprofit program. And so as we think through our, the most strategic way to invest our dollars related to the programs we're rolling out, I'd be curious to know what you're learning as you use these different types of media uh, in pushing out a message and maybe it can help inform some of what we do as well. So uh, whenever you have that kind of data, if you would share it, I would be grateful. I'd be happy to. Thank I'd you. I'd be happy to share that with you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you all mm -hmm. for your time. Thank you. And you're welcome to come back when there are more updates, uh, Renee, for sure. Next time in person. <laughs> okay, that'll, that'll work, yeah. So, I yeah. so thank you all for all that you continue to do in leading our county. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I have one comment I'd like to make. Um, we have a, a proclamation that we the board wants to give to Rose Lavelle, who is in town. Uh, she's from the Cincinnati area. She, um, along with the boxing recognition for the Olympic gold for uh, Duke Reagan, we recognized him. We also recognized um, Thompson, uh, Jordan Thompson for volleyball. And now uh, Rose Lavelle is here this, uh, this evening uh, to play against Paraguay. And she was unable to make it here. And I understand due to just some COVID precautions and also being focused on winning the game tonight. So as a board, I thought it was appropriate because she is from this area uh, to have a proclamation uh, delivered to her and um, she, her team won the bronze medal in the Olympics, in the Tokyo Olympics just recently. So the board will be presenting uh, or making sure she receives uh, the proclamation declaring today as Rose Lavelle Day in Hamilton County. So. Yeah, okay. All righty, thank you guys. I didn't have anything else, but what I'll do right now is open it up for my colleagues if there are any final uh, comments. Uh, Vice President Reese. No. No? Okay. Hearing none, I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. Second. Commissioner Samara Dumas? Yes. Commissioner Reeves? Yes. Commissioner Dreehouse? Yes. Thank you. Thank you.